So we're going to uh, th thank you, the four of you, for showing up. It's uh, I have done this before to an empty room, and it's really weird. So um, we're going to try not to do that. Um, the advantage is that it uh, um, the advantage of not having of having an audience is that it actually allows us to uh, interact, and you guys get to ask questions, which is also good. Yeah, no, I know. I, I, I'm kind of a little surprised. I know everybody got the email, right? Because I, I bulk spammed everyone. So, um, but they can watch it at their own time over the weekend, which is fine. Um, I suspect we might see a number of people trickling in um, afterwards. All right. So we ended our our review of basic um, uh, basic electronics last time. We were at capacitors. All right, and we said the, the hydraulic analogy of the capacitor is so you have your, your pump is your battery, you've got your low pressure, your high pressure, so what we'll do, low pressure, and high pressure up here. And what you get is you have this diaphragm that sort of flexes across as you increase the pressure across it, the diaphragm flexes outwards. If you release the pressure, it swings back and it'll create um, it can't do steady flow, but it can do oscillating flow. So the thing is, at very low frequency, it looks like an open circuit, and at very high frequency, it looks like a short circuit. So you can, it looks just like a wire. And um, so again, cannot pass any steady current. So at DC, it's an open circuit. Uh, the unit's farad, which is huge, so we tend to deal with pico and microfarads and nanofarads mostly. Um, and the cool thing is, is by having a um, by just putting in a complex version of a sine wave, right? And we could do it with a. Uh, the, the reason the sine wave is nice is because it doesn't switch from sine. To, the reason we, the complex one is nice is it doesn't switch from sine to cosine when you take the derivative, which would normally be the case, and then you have to do this funky trigonometric identity to get the same result. But if we do it this way, what we wind up with is we get the equivalent resistance of a capacitor is a complex impedance that is 1 over j omega c. And what that means is that at omega equals 0, this turns into kind of infinite resistance, which means it's effectively open. And at very, very high frequency, it, um, you know, as omega gets large, it drops towards 0. And so you get a, uh, it allows you to pass. All right, and um, we talked about how, they, uh, um, how they're made. And so the big key here is this E, this relative permeability, right? So like we said, a one, a one centimeter square, uh, two plates across from each other at uh, one mil apart, so 25 microns. It's about as good as we can do, all right? It's actually very hard to make anything that's any closer than that um, manufacturing-wise, winds up being about 35 picofarads, right? And to show you sort of what that is at 10 kilohertz, which is not a, you know, it's a slow signal, but it's not that slow. Um, it's still a 5 mega ohm resistor equivalent, so it's pretty big. And there's a couple of different ones. Uh, there are the ceramic capacitors. Uh, there are the uh, tin can electrolytics. Uh, so if you guys look at the, the part going around, there's a, that's a polarized electrolytic, 2.2 microfarad. Right? And you could get 2.2 microfarad in a much, much smaller package. In fact, the surface mount ones the, uh, are very, very small. Um, but nonetheless, they, uh, and the way, by the way, the surface mount guys do it is they use, so they have a, a substrate, and they use a, a vapor deposition process to put on a very thin layer of metal on either side of this dielectric, and then they, they keep layering this, and so it's a, it's a sandwich. Right? And they do it, and they get sort of layers and layers and layers and layers, and so they get actually quite a bit of area in a very, very small uh, package because the layers and, they, and the, the, the thickness between is very, very small, and they've got a dielectric which has a nice high constant. And so there's a... Um, uh, it's a special kind of ceramic. Actually not. They're super cheap. Um, again, uh, the bulk of the... And, and you'll see this if you ever if you start doing surface mount stuff. So surface mount comes in a couple of different sizes. Uh, the uh, 0402s are pretty close to microscopic. Um, they're tiny. Um, the 0603s 
are, and these all have sort of their standard sizes, uh, 0805s, so all of the really small resistors that you'll see on any of our stuff are in the 0805, and then 1206 gets to the point where you can actually kind of physically handle them. Right? And what you'll find is that um, when you have two capacitors of the same size, little surface mount capacitors, the 0805 in general, oops, um, the 0805 will be cheaper than the 1206 because the once they can achieve that capacitance, the bigger material cost for the larger size costs you more. Right? But these get down into the, you know, it, when you buy them in bulk, they get down to a you know, couple of cents a piece. Um, and the prices drop, so it's the price for 1 to 10 is, so there's a price for 1 to 10, uh, 10 to 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 500, 500 to 1,000, 1,000 up. All right? And it drops dramatically. Often, if you're buying 8, it's cheaper to buy 50. All right? And if you're buying 25, it's often cheaper to buy 100 or 500 than it is. And so you wind up a lot of them. And, you know, and the stupid thing, of course, is at that size, there are no markings on them whatsoever. Right? So you have to get them and bin them carefully um, to make sure. Because once you mix them, they're the same size, the same color. They are, and, and, it, and measuring capacitance is, is annoying. Yeah, you, 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 yeah, exactly. So they'll come in a tape, and sometimes they'll just come in a, uh, so yes, yeah, so they'll come in a little tape reel. And so we'll, in the manufacturing process, they actually have a machine that peels the tape, and as it peels the tape, there's a little arm, and it goes, and it sucks it, and it pulls it off, and it jams it down on the board. Uh, and so what they do, so um, manufacturing process is called a pick-and-place machine, um, and they are bulky, expensive, and fast. And the idea is that you take your PC board that comes in, it gets squeegeed with uh, solder paste through a mask so that it has points on the, so everywhere that something's supposed to land, it gets the solder paste. Um, and then the pick, it comes through in the pick-and-place machine, takes it, and it jams the part down on it. The paste is sticky enough that it sort of holds it in place. And then they run it through an oven that bakes it at a certain temperature, and that causes it to flow. Although a lot of things, what these guys do is they do a wave solder. So they actually have a standing wave of solder, and the board actually goes under the solder through the wave, um, and it passes out the other side, and the heat is enough to uh, to put solder on all the exposed leads and nowhere else. It's it's a very – if you get a chance, if you ever uh, take 174, I think it is, the uh, 173 or 174, the board layout class, 174. They do. It's in the E now. It's as opposed to, uh, to CE. Uh, they keep moving it around. Um, but if you take that class, he will actually take you to a fab plant. Um, and yeah, it, it's, a fabu it's a fabulous thing. They will actually show you all the, you know, all the process going through. It's really quite cool. Anyway, um, so, <clears throat> uh, and I talked about the gumdrops and everything else and very different kinds. As I said, we often will, will put a big and a small capacitor in parallel. Now, we'll go back and I'll, I'll show you. So capacitors in parallel add. And the reason they add is because their complex impedance is 1 over uh, j omega c. So when you do 1 over 1 over j omega c, it flips up into the numerator. And so you can, uh, you can get the equivalent 1. We'll, we'll do all of that. Um, so the place we really use capacitors all the time is in bypassing. So we call them bypass caps. And the idea is, say I've got an op amp. Right, and I'm doing some circuit with it, plus minus, and it has power and ground. And what you want to do is you want to stick a capacitor right across the power and ground as close to the chip as possible. In fact, so close that you really want the leads to straddle the chip so that the cap is sort of, so if here's the chip, right, with things like this and the board, that you have the capacitor um, sticking right up there across the top of the chip. All right? And the reason you want to do this is if you think about the traces on the board and the leads all the way back to the power supply of the battery, there's a long pipe to get the electrons from the source to your chip. All right? So think of it as trying to you know, suck a drink through a 10-foot long straw. All right? It takes a lot of suck to pull the drink up. All right? It's, it's a really long thing. It'll get there eventually, but it's going to take you a lot of work. And so what this cap does is give you a little local charge bucket so that when the op-amp needs more electrons, 
instead of grabbing it from immediately from that long delay way, it instead grabs it from its local charge bucket. This is so common that if you find, uh, if you do sort of wire app stuff, you'll often find chip carriers, right, that have the little holes in it to put your chip in. And they'll have a, inside the chip, they'll have a little capacitor that connects pin seven and four, uh, pin uh, one and 14, which are usually the, uh, the power and ground. Right? And there'll be a little capacitor there, so you just pop it in, put the chip on top, it's already got the capacitor there. Yeah, so, so they have those, um, and you can find uh, generally the, uh, the size here, um, you know, a 0.01 microfarad is plenty. Um, and you'll find often they make these little um, polymer ones, and they look like almost like a little ampular diode, and you can actually see the little windings uh, inside the little plates wrapped around each other. Um, so be a little wary that they come in all kinds of different flavors and sizes. So most of the ones we have for you guys are um, uh, tend to be the, the ceramic, uh, the ceramic disc ones, and the mylar, and a few others. Was that the bypass caps? Oh, the bypass it gives the chip a local charge bucket, right? So basically, think of so it's that same thing of drinking through a long straw, but instead you have a you know you have a bucket that you're putting it into. So it's so it's coming through the straw into the bucket, and then for any gulp you want, you basically take it out of the bucket, and the bucket is constantly being filled, right? And so the idea is it gives you a local reservoir of charge that's very close to you that you can get to very fast. It doesn't have a lot in it, but it has enough so that any short transients that you need get provided for. Um, it, well, there's the, to the, the, that's, that's filtering caps, which are usually next to the power supply. Um, the ones out here next to the chip itself are to basically prevent the chip from sagging the current, from sagging its, um, its voltage locally as it's... Uh, as is drawing current. All right, so uh, moving on, we're going to get to uh, our first new thing, so inductors. And so we're going to have our standard hydraulic analogy here. So here's my, here's my pump, here's my low pressure, and here's my high pressure. And the way to think of an inductor is that I have this rather heavy paddle wheel in the stream, right? So it comes here and it flows out there. And so this thing basically, as the flow goes by, right, this thing starts to spin up. Right? So the initial, so it resists the flow when you first start it. It takes a while to spin up. Right? As it goes, it goes, it spins, it spins, it spins. It gets going at a good rate right? to match the flow coming through. And then if you stop the flow, it doesn't stop. It keeps going. So even if you shut down your pump, it's going to keep moving stuff across. Right? In fact, if you shut down your pump, it's going to massively drop the pressure in the high pressure area and increase the pressure in the low pressure area. It's going to just shove current through. It's going to deplete it from the top and push it through the bottom. Right? So that's the, the hydraulic analogy. And in the electrical world, we have our battery. Right? So there's our battery going up. And I'm going to have a, a switch up here. And here's my inductor, and then it goes through some load resistor, right? And basically, I'll call that ground. So I close the switch. This starts to, it prevents the current from flowing. The current slowly rises to full. If I open the switch, the current keeps flowing, and it's going to generate the voltage needed to keep the current flowing, all right? So since the current is going to flow that way, all right, and it needs current to keep flowing, right? If I open this switch, right, it's going to keep trying to drive current around, which means it's going to um, start dropping the voltage. It's going to start uh, increasing the voltage here and dropping it there, right, to keep that current flowing across, right? And it's going to keep doing that and keep doing that and keep doing that until this will arc um, and it'll reconnect. Um, that way, and, and this, this inductive kick is, uh, it comes out in every time we sort of drive. So a uh, couple of things. So first of all, let's do the symbols. 
All right, so there's these guys, which would be an air core. Um, there is that, which would be no core. Um, though it's not formal, sometimes you see things that look like this for a magnetic core. And these are all the, the things that are inside the wire that it wraps around. And you'll probably never see one of these in your life, but they have variables. Variable inductors are very rare and strange devices. Um, generally don't see them. Um, in terms of examples of what you might uh, see with them, uh, basically every motor, every solenoid, every coil of wire right, that you see. All right. we'll, we'll make one. And the constitutive relationship is that the voltage equals L di dt. Okay. So the voltage is proportional to L times the time rate of change of current. So when I close that switch, for instance, right, I'm going to get a slow climb up in voltage versus time. Right, it's going to prevent it from, when I first close the switch, it's going to climb up. And when I, uh, when I turn off the switch, it's going to, it's going to go the other way. All right, it's going to give, a, give me a nice big spike. All right. So we're going to do the same thing that we did with the, uh, with the capacitor. And I'm going to say the inductor, let's put the current on here, is equal to some I naught e to the j omega t, right? Again, I'm going to put a, uh, a sinusoidal input on it. And so v is equal to l di dt, which in this case is going to be um, uh, l uh, i naught j omega e to the j omega t. And if I uh, if I call this v naught, then I've got that v naught is equal to rather um, take the i naught out there. So that's so let's maybe a little more crisp here. So I'm just going to put this as um, j omega l i naught e to the j omega t. Right, and I'm going to call J omega L um, this one uh, V naught. Then I've got that V is equal to, um, no, I'll call this whole thing V naught. There we go. Uh, v naught E to the J omega T. And normally we have V equals I R. Right? So in this case, I've got the analogy of it is that v naught e to the j omega t is equal to um, j omega l um, uh, e to the j omega t, right, with this i naught. And I say, wait a minute, this looks awful lot like what we had before. So I've got that V naught equals J omega L I naught, right, just by definition. I say, well, this, this looks an awful lot like my resistor. So the complex impedance of an inductor is J omega L. All right, so if I put, so now I've got all three of them, right? So I've got the resistor is just R. Let's do this. The resistor is R. Z capacitor is 1 over J omega C. And the inductor is equal to J omega L. Right? So again, at zero frequency, right, the inductor looks like um, zero, uh, zero, sorry, it passes DC just fine. Right? But as you get the higher frequency, this becomes a larger and larger resistor. Right? So whereas it's the, it's, the, it's the exact opposite. Right? Whereas the capacitor is an open circuit at DC and a short circuit at high frequency, the inductor is the opposite side. 
It's a short circuit at DC and an open circuit at high frequency. Right. And so um, we use them in a whole bunch of different places. All right. So there's a couple of different ones they look like. So this one has a solid core. Uh, this is an iron core in here. Um, this one is a toroidal. Uh, when you see our uh, the boards we give you, you'll see there's a little a little toroidal inside a shield on top of ours um, that we use. Um, by the way, there's a uh, company called Coilcraft, which will sample pretty much every kind of inductor they have at every uh, for everything. Although generally you don't need them very much. Um, so um, we use them. So we sort of get them whether we want them or not, or in terms of every time we're using a motor, we're using an inductor, whether we like them. But where we use them normally uh, is you'll see them in all kinds of switching power supplies. Hello? 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 Oh, we are. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So the switching power supplies, the way it works, so there's two kinds of power supplies you guys are going to deal with. So there's what are called the LDOs for the low dropout regulator. And what this is is so you give it 5 volts, for instance. Uh, you give it a range. And it goes in. And you get 3.3 volts out. Right? And it has a common ground cooked up to it. And of course, there's a filter cap on the front, a filter cap on the back. Um, those are there to smooth out the ripples in it. But the LDOs, what it says is, as long as there's enough difference between the 5 volts and the 3.3, right? And this is sort of a range, right? This will go from 4 volts up to you know 9 volts. And you have this range in here. It'll give you a 3.3. And what it is is a little feedback loop inside, right? And it operates in linear range. And it's dissipating the excess power as heat, right? So it's not a particularly efficient device, right? And that you're just dumping power. But it is very, very clean. Right. Now the problem is, you know, with this you get, you know, you're burning the excess power. So depending on what, how big a drop you get, you know, you're getting maybe 25% efficiency, something like that. So you're dumping 75% of your power um, into heat, and it's got to radiate that heat. The other thing that's happened, but it is quiet, it's clean, and that's uh, that's very nice. And then if you get to usually, so depending on the load, depending on how much the regulator needs, some of them need, you know, a half a volt to do the regulation cleanly. Um, so if you get to, you know, 3.8 volts on your input, it just shuts down. It drops out, which is why it's called the low dropout regulator. If the input gets too low, the whole thing just drops, and you get zero, zero voltage coming out the other side. Yeah. Ah, the advantage of this over a voltage divider is a voltage divider will sag as you load it. Right? So a voltage divider, as soon as you put a load on the other side, you no longer have that same voltage. This will hold that voltage regardless of what load you put on it within range. All right? within how much you can do. Now, because these are inefficient, what they use instead is they use a switching regulator. A switching regulator. And what a switching regulator does is it has control, right? And it goes, and it has essentially a little switch that goes on and off. And there's a an inductor, a little diode. Um, so VN comes in here. And by controlling this switch on and off, what they're doing is they charge up, they basically create a magnetic field on the inductor, and then collapse the field to give you, um, and you can, you can go both directions. You can go a step up, so you can get more voltage than you put in, or you can go more commonly a step down. Right? So those are referred to as buck or boost. Uh, so the buck steps you down, the boost pushes you up. Um, there are even some that are buck or boost, which will switch topologies depending on what the input is. It'll sort of keep trying to. And the thing is, because you're doing this constant switching, you've got a, a rippling current on the a rippling voltage and a rippling current on the outside. So whereas these guys up here are probably uh, accurate to about a half a percent all right, on, uh, on regulation, if not better. Right, so on a 3.3 volt rail, you'll probably see less than uh, 5 millivolts uh, swing. These guys, you might see a 50 millivolt swing on that, which means it's a lot noisier. So one of the tricks we'll often do if we need a particularly clean supply 
is you'll use a switcher to go, say I've got 12 volts in and I need 3.3 volts out, right, and clean. I could put an LDO in from 12 volts to 3.3, but I'm dumping a lot of power, right, so, and a lot of heat, right, and I have to deal with that, right, so, you know, if I'm plugged into the wall, it's not as big a deal, but if I'm, if I'm on a battery, that is a big deal, right, um, and so what I might do is go through a switcher that'll take me to an intermediate switcher that runs at, you know, 98% efficiency, um, which they often can, all right, 92, 98%, that's fine. Um, and I'll come to an intermediate one of, say, um, 4 volts. And then I'll put the LDO here to get me out to 3.3. What will happen is this one will ripple, but when I gang the two of these together, there's almost no ripple on the outside, all right, which gives me a very, very clean supply. Um, so this is typically if I'm working with analog electronics, all right, and I need a very, very clean supply. Um, I'll, uh, I'll do things like this. Okay. Do they use the combination? Uh, the ATX inside that uh, that goes in your PC is using a transformer. Uh, it uses sort of a different topology with a with a uh, back switch, um, and they are uh, they're more or less a switching supply, and they just leave it, and then they'll supply 3.3 volts, and then on the core there will be another basically an LDO that will drop it down to um, 1.8 or you know, or 0.9, depending which what they're running the, the internal core voltage at. So there'll, there'll be things like that. All right. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't tell you what the unit of, the unit of measure of, a, uh, of an inductor. Okay, so the unit is the Henry. And again, uh, a Henry is a huge unit of inductance. So typically you'll see things along the lines of micro Henrys. Um, is typically where, you're, where you'll be at. Um, and again, the other place you'll see this is line filtering. So if you have something that's going to rise and you want a slow start, you just put an inductor in line with it, right? So V in, V out, and what that hap what that does is it says, look, I'm going to do a soft start and a soft fall, right? So if you if you put it on, it'll build up slowly. If you take it off, it'll ramp down slowly, right? Okay, exactly. So think about that having so yeah. So think about giving the your your the the analog is you're giving your electrical circuit mass, right? So it doesn't speed up very fast and it doesn't slow down very fast. Right, and on the so for instance, we use this trick to um, on our power distribution board that comes from your batteries. We have two of these, one on the power, one on the ground, that then go up to the uh, that powers the top board with the microcontroller on it. And the reason we do that is we want it to to roll on and roll off softly, even if you're sagging the battery all over the place by by running motors, right? With so that every time you switch the motors, they're you know they're drawing a whole bunch of current and then putting it back. So all of a sudden they're um, you know the battery itself is starting to get noisy, and because we've got in this, it sort of, it doesn't affect it as much. It keeps it generally, uh, generally quiet. All right. So a more powerful motor will have uh, larger... Inductance, yep. Yeah, the, the bigger the motor, the lower the resistance of the armature, and the, the bigger the inductance, right? So basically, they get fatter wires wrapped around more, right? Because they're trying to get magnetic field, and remember that what an inductor does is it creates, so the way an inductor works, um, back in, so our analogy uh, here of the, of the water wheel, uh, what's carrying the momentum is the magnetic field in, that, the, that the inductor creates, right? So the current goes through a coil, creates a magnetic field, and that mag magnetic field will collapse as you, when you separate out, when you stop flowing current through it. And so that's the, that collapse will then cause the boost. Right, the magnetic field that induces an electrical field inside the coil as it collapses. So that's what we uh, that's what we do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, a switching regulator is generally well it depends on how you how well you design it, but eighty to ninety five percent for a switcher um, is pretty typical, and um, it, a lot of it depends on how you load it. Surprisingly, they get more efficient the more you load them. Right, so if you have 100 milliamps, it's actually quite hard to get it that efficient. But if you're pulling three amps, you can get up to you know up of 97 percent. And sort of it, it, each one will. Uh, um, if you're interested in doing that, TI provides a uh, an online design tool for um, for doing this stuff, and it'll do it. All right. So moving along, uh, basic circuit analysis. So 
there's two that we use. There's the Kirchhoff, and I've sort of seen this spelled in a billion different ways. So Kirchhoff's current law, or KCL, basically says it's the analog of the conservation of mass. All right? So if I have a bunch of... Oh, sorry, voltage. One is mass, one is momentum. Let's start with, uh, let's start with KVL. All right? So the idea here is that around any closed loop that I go, the voltage drop around any closed loop that I can imagine, right? So the sum of the voltages around any closed loop has to be zero, which is to say that the potential has to always return back to itself, right? So if I measure the potential across uh, the same point, I should get zero. If I go and measure at different points around, and so if I put the two ends of my multimeter here, right, I get zero, right? They're both connected to ground, I get zero. If I go and I measure all of the things back, they have to add up back to zero. Right? So that's the logic. Right. Because I can't I can't sustain around a closed path, I have to get I have to get it back, essentially, or else something is is deeply wrong in that I'm sort of storing electrons somewhere. Right? And they're not they're not going there. Okay. So um, so again, all of the the sum of all of the voltage gains or drops around any closed loop is zero. Okay? So basically V, so we have that V minus IR, right, has got to be zero, right? So here I've got V up here, right, because I'm putting my voltage with the battery. Right, and I have an IR voltage drop across this one, and I get back V equals IR. Right? So it's, it's a bit of a tautology, because I use V equals IR to tell me what the, the voltage drop was. But in this case, I've got a, uh, I get back there. Um, so this is one. The other one we use is um, Kirchhoff's current law, okay, CL. And what this one says is, to any node, all of the current flowing in must equal all of the current flowing out, right? And that the current can't accumulate inside any node, right? And so this is the equivalent. So Kirchhoff's circuit uh, voltage law is the equivalent of conservation of momentum, right? And that sort of momentum cannot be changed without an external force, right? And this one is the equivalent of conservation of mass, right? I can't sit there and accumulate mass. Yeah. Can you group uh, several Um, can you group some of them? You can, yeah, you can collapse things and say all the current flowing in has to equal the current flowing out, right? And that's, uh, so, so a node in this case can be, you know, can be anything. If you sort of can put a dashed line around things that's closed, the current flowing in has to be flowing out. It's the same trick we do when, uh, when analyzing aircraft performance. You put sort of a, a box around the atmosphere, around the aircraft. You say, okay, whatever momentum flows in has got to flow out, and anything that's, you know, Anything that's changed has to be supplied in energy by the uh, um, by the engines on the aircraft, right? So it's a, what's that? Exactly, exactly. So you, you can do that quite. So basically, the summation of all of the currents going into a node has to equal to zero, which is to say you cannot accumulate electrons within a node. All right, so <clears throat> we've got one last one, which we use, which are the seven and equivalents. All right, so if I have some complicated circuit, R4, um, call this one R1, call this one R3, call this one R2, um, hook that to ground, right? So no matter how complicated this circuit is, I can always rewrite this circuit. Any circuit composed of uh, the linear components, that would be, um, so all linear components would be resistors, capacitors, inductors, 
um, and voltage and current sources, any of them, I can always rewrite this as an equivalent voltage source, V Thevenin, and an equivalent resistor, might be complex, right, if I've got inductors and capacitors in there, um, R Thevenin, and that's it. I can take anything and turn it into an equivalent voltage supply and an equivalent resistor and collapse anything as long as I can put two nodes, as long as I'm measuring it across two points. Right? So those two points, for instance. And the way that we do this, so there's a couple of different, um, different ways we do it. So the first one is uh, in order to get v -thevenin. So v -thevenin is equal to the open circuit voltage across the two nodes in the circuit. Right, so all I have to do is say, okay, these are open right here between these two points, and what is the voltage that I develop across this across those two points, and that is my that is my voltage source. Okay, that's the uh, um, one way of doing. Um, and then you can do uh, there's a couple of other ways. So then then that's usually the easy one. Is okay, I've got the open. The open circuit voltage, I can say, okay, what, what do I got for the open circuit voltage here? So if that's open, right, I have current flowing through here. I have uh, no current flowing across that one, right, because it's an open circuit, right? And so I can then just sum the voltage drops using Kirchhoff's, um, Kirchhoff's voltage drop across here, find what the voltage is here. If there's no current across there, then the voltage at that point is the voltage at that point, and I now have my V open circuit. I have my V7 in it, right? Now you say, okay, that's great. R thevenin, however, is a little more complicated. Right? So you have R thevenin, right? and there's two ways of doing R thevenin. The first one you can do is you can say R thevenin is equal to V open circuit over I short circuit. Right? So that's open circuit, and here is short circuit. So you're saying, okay, I got my thevenin equivalent voltage. Right. by opening the circuit up and measuring and calculating what the voltage is across those two points. And now I'm going to go ahead and short these two together. Right. So if I short these two together, right, and I calculate what is the current going across across that point, right, and I calculate the current going across that point, divide, it by, uh, divide that into the open circuit voltage, and I wind up with a 7 equivalent. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it, is which I think is a little easier, is you short all voltage sources, you open all current sources, and then R thevenin is the equivalent equivalent uh, network after you've done that. So in our case. If I short the voltage sources, I have R1, R3, I have R4, those go to ground, and I have R2 here, R2. So now, if I look at this, this is, so I've got these two are in series which is in parallel with that one and in series with R2. So this looks like, so R7 in here looks like R2 plus, I've got R1 plus R4 in parallel with R3. And the neat thing is you can do this whether they're capacitors or inductors, you just use the complex impedance. You can do this, um, through any arbitrary number, no matter how they're connected. Right? And it's a very, very powerful thing because then you can take this complicated network and say, all right, as far as I'm concerned, this looks like one complex impedance and one voltage source and nothing else. Right? And they're exactly, exactly equivalent. OK. Uh, the other way you could do it, um, let's say I have, um, so I have my voltage. Back to the same network, I have R1, I have 
R3, R2, and that came out, and then I had, uh, oops, that was R4 down here, and R2. So what I can do is I can say, look, I'm going to get the, so there's I1, and there is I2, and I'm just going to go around each loop. and write down what we've got. So I've got two closed loops here that I'm looking at. All right, so I've got that um, going around this one, uh, so for I1, I've got V7 in equals, so whatever V is here, V, and I've got minus I1 R1 minus I1 R3 minus I1, R4, and then plus I2, R3. Right? So that's the coming up there. And I've got the other the other loop coming around is closed. Right? And for that one, I've got minus um, R3, I2. Right? Plus R3, I1, minus I2, R2, right, as it comes down, as I go around, and that has to equal zero, right? I basically just go around and just add up the voltage drops, and then we say, okay, so I2 equals zero is open circuit, and the other way is that I2 not equals zero is my short circuit. Right? And I can go back and basically redo this analysis using that that way as well. Okay, so there we are. Everything is uh, is done. All right. So we can start to use these. So let's use this to basically figure out what voltages, what resistors and capacitors and inductors do in series or parallel. So I have a circuit that looks like V, and it goes through, and here is R1, and here is R2, and I come down here, call that ground. So I say, all right, so I have, I can do this as a current, as one current loop here, right? And I know that V over here equals I times R1 parallel R2, right? It's got or V minus I1 R2 equals zero, or parallel I2 equals zero. And I said, but I can also do a little tiny current loop in there, right? Still a closed loop, right? So I can do the voltage drops across that closed loop, right? Have to add up to zero. That one's at V, and that one's at zero. All right, so let me go through and do the do that path around, right? And I've got the so I've got this little I in here, right? And I've got the I is equal to um, uh, zero. So I've got I coming up and I going around, right? Is the so I can get so around so around any node, all the current flowing in has to be zero. Right? So I have the, the two branches coming in here. Or I can sort of go around the loop and I can say, well this is uh, zero minus so if I go this way, I got zero minus uh, VR1, right? Coming around the other side, right, is um, V minus, uh, so I is um, the voltage drop over R1, and V minus 0 over R2, right? And those two, right, so that's the, that's the voltage drops going all around, right, has to equal to, to 0, right? And if I do this, I get the equivalent that V is 1 over 1 over R1 
plus 1 over R2. All right? And therefore, um, that means that R1 parallel R2 is equal to 1 over 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, because right? they show up in the denominator on both sides. All right? And this is equivalent to R1, R2 over R1 plus R2. Right? So the idea here is that resistors are right, in parallel. And we do the same thing if they're in series. And they're in series, it's just even easier, R1, R2. So R1 in series, right, R1 to R2, is just equal to R1 plus R2. And you can just see if you just add up the voltage drop, it just keeps going that way right, as you go around. Okay. So now let's look at something a little more um, useful, the voltage divider. So this is probably the most common circuit you'll ever use. So we have a V in. You go through an R1. You have a V out that you measure here. And you go through an R2, and you go to ground. All right. So here, let's do a current. So I1 here. I2 there. And the idea is that um, V out draws no current. Right? And this is, by the way, you asked, why, why, why not use a voltage divider for this instead? Right? Because if V out starts drawing any current, this analysis no longer holds. Right? And since it's going to draw some finite current if you're using it for something, then it means that this is gonna, it's going to change. Right? As you draw current away, it's going to change. And that will that'll be a little bit more, uh, more challenging. But Let's do our, so I've got I1 is equal to V in, or V out minus V in. No, yeah, V out minus V in over R1. And I2 is equal to V out minus 0 over R2. Right? Now we got that backwards. That should be V in minus V out. Okay? And because I'm assuming that nothing flow, no current flows into V out, it's just a potential measurement across, right? then I'm going to do, I'm going to set those two currents equal to each other, V in minus V out, all over R1 is equal to V out over R2. Right. And if I rearrange a few things um, here, I've got that. So cross multiply, move things around, and I get the V out over Vn is equal to R2 over R1 plus R2. So this is the voltage divider equation. Right, we use this all the time. All right, and what we've got here, so always important, check the corner cases. All right? If R2 were 0, then I would expect that V out, so if R2 were, were a straight path to ground, then I expect that V out would be ground no matter what V in was. Right? And you say, OK, if R2 goes to 0, yep, it goes to 0 no matter what V in does. Likewise, if R2 were infinite, an open circuit, okay then I would expect that no current would flow between V in and V out. That would be at the same potential. Right? So if R2 goes to infinity, I've got infinity over infinity plus something, which is still infinity over infinity, which is 1, which means that V in over V out is 1. All right? So it's always sort of important to check those, those corner cases. And you say, OK, now let's do something a little funny. Okay? Let's do, um, we're going to do our same voltage divider. V in, here's R, and here's V out. And instead of putting a, a resistor in there, I'm going to put a capacitor in there. And I'm going to analyze it exactly the same way, except that I'm going to use the complex impedance rather than the, um, rather than the straight resistor. So basically, it's the same equation I had before. Here's in, right, here's out like that. And I've got R1 equals to R. 
and R2 equals 1 over J omega C. Okay. And so I had that V out over Vn was equal to R2 over R1 plus R2. R2, getting chicken scratchy. There we go. R2. And so that's going to be 1 over J omega C all over R plus 1 over J omega C. So we're going to multiply up by J omega C to get rid of the, uh, the thing. And then what I have is I'm going to have that that's 1 over J omega RC plus 1. All right, so there we are. And that is, and I'm just going to rewrite that as V out over V in is equal to 1 over 1 plus J omega RC. Okay, so let's take a look at this. At omega equals 0, right, this equals to 1. Right? At omega equals infinite, that equals to 0. Right? At omega equals um, 1 over RC, right? then this is equal to um, uh, square root of 2 over 2. Right? And the reason is, of course, is that you have the, the real, the imaginary, and so when you look at it and you're here, the magnitude of it is square root of 2 length. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say, look, from for small omega, this looks approximately like 1. For large omega, this looks like 1 over omega. Right? So I'm going to plot this. Come up. There we go. I'm going to plot this as log of V out over V in versus log of omega. Now, the reason I want to do log of omega okay, is because this. This looks a lot like omega to the minus 1, which means on a log omega plot, this looks like it has a slope of minus 1. So I'm going to look at this, and I'm going to say, OK, here's, uh, here's omega is 1 over RC. It's right. the RC time constant. All right. And it's going to be 1. right? And the other unit you'll see in this, by the way, is if I use uh, 20 log of V out over V in, right? That is called decibels, right? And if I use 8 log V out over V in, then it's um, octaves, all right? So for whatever music goes in uh, in eighths, and uh, we tend to do power in uh, um, in dB. So 20 log of 1 would be 0. So in dB, this would be... 0 dB, but it would be 1. It stays here, and then it drops down at a slope of minus 1, or in dB, it's going to be minus 10 dB per decade, which is, say, every 10 I go up in frequency, I'm dropping 10 dB. And this point right here, right at the corner frequency, this is called the corner frequency, all right? I'm at minus 3 dB, or I'm here at 0.707, right, 1 over square root of 2. Right? And this, by the way, this is called a Bode plot. Right, this, uh, um, and the Bode, you do not just the, not just the magnitude, but also the, the phase. Right? Because what's going to happen is you're going to get a 90-degree phase shift as you go through here. Right? It's going to lag by 90 degrees, and then it'll go to 180 degrees as you keep eventually get to the end. All right. So that's pretty cool. All right, so all of a sudden, just using a straight voltage divider, but using the complex impedance. So this is, so the low-pass filter, this is a single-pole low-pass filter, what you get from one RC circuit, all right, gets you, it passes all frequencies up to your time constant, your RC time constant, and then it starts rolling them off at a rate of 10 dB per decade, all right, or at a slope of minus 1, so you get an order of magnitude drop every decade, right? 
Every decade you go, you get a factor of 10 less sigma. So if my RC was at, um, uh, I set it for a 1 kilohertz signal, a 10 kilohertz signal would come through at 1 tenth. So if I put in, so example, I have uh, RC is set for 1 kilohertz, right? So DC comes through. So if a straight signal comes through unaltered, a 1 kilohertz wave comes through at 0.707 times its amplitude from peak to peak, and a 10 kilohertz wave is going to come in at 0.1, right? So it's going to attenuate it, 100 kilohertz, 0.01, it's going to keep dropping as you go through. All right, so this is a low-pass filter. We use this to get rid of high-frequency things and allow low frequencies to pass. Um, likewise, you can go the opposite way and construct the exact same thing with the capacitor on top and the resistor on the bottom, and that's a high-pass filter that allows high frequency but blocks all low frequency. Right? So it gets rid of DC. So anything at DC is not there, and it, you get the, high, the, the one. The other one we can do to be a little bit more complicated, and I don't actually ever recommend you build a bandpass filter this way, but um, you can do it. So here's R1, here's V out, and here's going to be a capacitor and an inductor in parallel. All right. So that's L, that's C. So here, now, I'm going to do, so remember that R in parallel right, is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Well, in this case, I've got the RL is equal to J omega L, and RC is equal to 1 over J omega C. So if I put those two in parallel and work out the math, I get J omega L over 1 minus omega squared LC. Right? And then if I go through and I do my, my voltage divider circuit, I get the V out over V in is going to equal to um, J omega L over 1 minus omega squared LC all over R. I have R1, but I'll just do this R, um, plus J omega L over 1 minus omega squared LC. Right? And again, I'm going to multiply up by this 1 over omega LC, omega squared LC, just to get into a slightly nicer form. And I'll have that this turns out to be J omega L over R times 1 minus omega squared LC plus J omega L. Okay, so this is V out over V in. Now, let's check the corner conditions in this. At omega equals zero, right, I've got a zero in the numerator, and I've at least got an R in the denominator, so that's going to be zero. Okay? At um, omega equals infinity, then this is looking roughly like one over omega, right, coming up, right, so 1 over omega, because these kind of cancel out, right, and what's left is I've got a 1 over omega squared, I've got an omega in the numerator and omega squared in the denominator, so it's going as a 1 over omega, right, down there, and for kind of low frequencies up, right, I have a, it looks roughly like an omega, um, if omega is small, it looks like roughly an omega because R dominates the denominator, right? So when I plot this, so again, I'm going to plot this as log of V out over V in, and here is log omega. What I've got is basically I come in at a slope of 1, I descend at a slope of 1, and I get anything from a rounded to a very sharp peak at the corner frequency. So this has a slope of plus 1, this has a slope of minus 1, right? and at my corner frequency, I get this peak. The, uh, and that peak should be, is going to be above 1. Right? And where that, the, sort of the measure of how sharp that peak is, is called Q. 
right? You may have heard this about the filter. They, they refer to it as Q. And the idea is the larger I make R, the smaller that peak gets, the, the more rounded it gets. So if I make R very, very small, I get a very sharp peak. If I make R big, I get a very blunt and rounded peak. Right? And what this does is it allows only frequencies within this band to pass. Frequencies below it get chopped out. Frequencies above it get chopped out. All right? So therefore, if I put in, you know, there's one frequency I'm interested in, everything below gets attenuated, everything above gets attenuated, just as one thing passes. Now, um, whenever designing, uh, and we'll show you uh, in about two weeks how to do this with active circuits using op amps that are a bit more precise and easier to tune and don't need inductors all over the place. However, um, what's interesting about all of this is that you can, um, if you if you sort of make Q very big, right? What essentially you've built is a resonator, right? And so um, anything is going to excite the circuit at that frequency, and it's going to it's going to shake at that frequency. So when you're designing bandpass filters, uh, when you're designing filters in in general, um, don't be greedy, right? So get enough amplification that you need, but don't try to go all at once in one stage, or you will. Um, discover that you'll get bitten, and it won't help very much. All right, so right, so so as R gets smaller, that peak gets taller, right, and you get more resonance essentially. So you're you're driving it to a resonance, and if you make if you make that peak big enough, then what happens is it will find that frequency in anything, anywhere, right. There will always be something that's enough to start oscillating at that frequency, and it'll keep resonating, right? And so that's why you, in, in general, be a little careful of being too ambitious, of making it too sharp and too peaky, right? Instead, make it rounded so that you have you know, reasonable attenuation. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah, so you'll get amplified. In fact, if you have, if you have zero R, you get resonance at that, and presumably it'll go to infinite, except it won't. It'll, there, there is some, there is a every capacitor. So every capacitor has um, what they call an equivalent series resistor in with capacitor. Right? And they're small, but they exist. Right? You can't make a capacitor that has no, each one has, it, it, the the true capacitor is a capacitor plus a small resistor. Same thing with the inductors, right? We can't make them so they have no resistance. Although they can get pretty close. So once again, uh, just to re recap, so R of a resistor is just R. R of a capacitor is 1 over J omega C. And R of an inductor is J omega L. All right, and those will... J is... Uh, the square root of negative one. It's a complex number. Yeah. Uh, the reason we don't use I, uh, the reason we use J and not I in electrical engineering terms is because I is always the current. Right. And so therefore you use J instead of I. Because um, or else you get, you know, a little skeefy. Okay. Um, you're going to be doing a lot of measurements uh, in circuits, and it's important to know uh, how the, the multimeter actually works. So if I have, so the way a multimeter works is I have a little battery in there, right? And it has a very precise um, resistor that it has in there. And then here are your two leads. And what you're going to do is you're going to stick another resistor across here that you're measuring, right? And it's going to say, okay, I know what this one is, and therefore I can back out if I, you know, I know how much current to, and I know how much current I flow, I can back out the measurement of how much I've got. Okay. So, and essentially internal, it's got a very, very, it's got a big resistor in there um, to keep the current flow minimal, so it forces the current into your um, your resistor. And R big is approximately one mega ohm for a typical handheld multimeter. Now, the reason you've got to be a little careful with this is, so this is internal to the multimeter. Now, what happens if I have my own circuit, right, and I have my own circuit here that has some voltage source, 
right? And I'm going through some resistor here. And I say, look, I'm just going to stick my multimeter across here and measure the resistance across that. Right. Problem is, what happens? There's two voltage sources. There's two voltage sources. There's two, there's, you know, it's, it's measuring current across this little resistor it's got, but you've just set up another one in parallel to it and two different sources of current coming in, uh, which means you will get a wrong measurement. So if you ever, ha ever want to measure resistance of a circuit in, um, in situ, right? You've got to break contact, right? You've got to break the, you, you've got to open up the, uh, you've got to basically disconnect your power source from it so that you can measure across. So that the only current is coming from the multimeter itself. Now the other, so this is when you're measuring uh, resistance. When you want to measure current, so if you want to measure voltage, that's fine, right? Because when you want to measure voltage, so here, you want to say I've got some other resistor here, and I want to know what the voltage is at this point. So here, I connect it to ground, and I put it to my multimeter. And now here, it's going to work fine, because what it's going to do when you're measuring voltage as opposed to resistance is it says, right, I'm going to put essentially internal, a precise resistor across, and I'm going to measure, because this resistor is there, I'm going to measure the current path coming down here. I can measure the voltage drop across my resistor, uh, and therefore I can, I can do that. So this is when I'm measuring voltage. And the last one, and this one is the one that screws everybody up, when I want to measure my current, um, I want to know how much current I'm doing. Do not do that, all right? Because what will happen there is the way you measure current is it's trying to measure the flow across from one probe to the other. And in order to measure current, it doesn't want to interfere, so it puts the smallest resistor it can possibly do in between. So what you have done at this point is create a short circuit through a very small resistor, uh, which will pop the fuse inside. Uh, and they have fuses, so they're all they're all fused um, to do that. And you, know, you have to take take a screwdriver to the back, open them up, pop the fuse out, put another fuse in. Um, and often you'll see that they have a, a milliamp range and a 10 amp range. So they have two different resistors that they put across it, uh, depending on what you do. So if you're going to measure current, uh, then the thing to do is you have to break your uh, the point, and you're going to hook up the multimeter in series. So this is to measure current. Right. So those are uh, important stuff. All right, let's see. OK, um, so that's it for the linears. Now let's do um, some of the nonlinear elements. So the first one we're going to do, the simplest one, is a diode. All right. So here is a diode. And what this looks like physically is it's a little cylinder, and it's got a little stripe at one end, like that. And that stripe is the wall on the symbol. Okay? They're always the same. And the fluid flow analogy is that this is a, so you have your pipe that's flowing. And what I've got is I've got a little valve in here with a little block this way. So if fluid flow goes this way, it's fine. But if you try to flow current backwards, the little valve slams shut and it doesn't let any flow go past. Right? So this is a one-way valve for electrons. Right? It lets electrons flow through in one direction, but not in the other. Right? And so um, what we've got here is basically, as I start to forward bias it, that is to generate a potential across here, when I get to approximately 0 0.6 volts, right, it basically lets as much current through as, as you want. It looks like essentially a wire going right through. But if I try to go reverse, right, you can see that out to here, 50 volts, 100 volts, uh, I'm letting through only a microamp, a trickle of current. Very little gets passed. Now, you'll notice that at some point here, roughly about minus 80 volts, 
all right, of going across it, it all of a sudden it says, okay, it gives up. And it says, at that point, you have blown through the semiconductor that allows it to conduct one way, and it will now conduct in both directions just fine. It looks like a wire, and you've gotten rid of, you, you've destroyed the part that was a diode. All right, and it's now, so it, so it can go into reverse conduction once, all right, and that's it. Right, and at that point, you've lost, uh, you've lost it already. Right, you, you, you've killed your diode. There are other special diodes. Yeah, I mean, basically, just it, yeah. No, it, you know, the, the idea is you can take you, you can't take in, you if you take in a reverse conduction all the way into breakdown. Uh, so this is called the this is called the breakdown voltage. Break down voltage, and at breakdown, it basically. Um, that's it. It's it's gone. You've killed it. So if you stay below the breakdown voltage, you're okay. But if you exceed it, then it's dead. Um, what if you exceed it in the positive? There is no positive breakdown voltage. So it's totally fine to pump an 80 volts in the rating. Sure. And and they will they will have a rating. So for instance, the little diodes that we give you to solder in have a thousand volt forward rating. All right. So nothing you're likely to get to. Okay. Um, and those are super cheap. Those are like I think they're they're two cents a uh, I think. All right. Um, we've also got uh, Zener diodes. Now, Zener diodes are a special form of diode, right? and they have the special symbol with these little wings on them. You know? And the idea here is that unlike, so they look just like the normal diode. Right? So he goes up at approximately 0.6 volts, but they have a a zening voltage for the reverse breakdown. And the difference is these is, so this is uh, V zene. And basically, it's the same as the reverse breakdown, except these are made to go into reverse breakdown and back out constantly. Right? So the idea is you can take these in and out of reverse breakdown, um, but they will only break down to specific voltage. So between 0 and V zene, they will not let current pass. Once you exceed V zene, they will. So a way that you might use this, for instance, is a really poor man's uh, voltage supply. So I have V in, V out, and I'm going to put a Zener diode to ground this way. Right? And basically, if V in is greater than, so V out is going to equal to V Zener. Right? So if this was a 5-volt Zener, Right, and I put 12 volts in, right? as soon as the voltage up here rises above 5 volts, this one goes in conduction, and it sinks current to ground. And so it's going to, and drops down to 5. Right? And at 5, it stops conducting. Right? And so you're going to sit there, and you will, you will consume enough power through such that you will sag V in until it gets to 5. Right? And it's going to get hot, and you're dissipating power. It's not a particularly good way of doing it, but it's, a, it, it's something that we, uh, we use uh, occasionally. All right. Uh, doing it that way, uh, reasonably stable. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty clean. It winds up sort of finding sort of the, the exact point. Um, so one of the ways we uh, you'll see a common use for diodes is what's called a full wave bridge. All right. So we have this, that, um, and I have this way and that way. So the diodes kind of all point left to right. And what I'm going to do is this is going to go to an AC supply, right? as in your wall mains, for instance. And this is going to your DC circuit. And here's your load coming this way. Now, so I have my AC wave. Does something like that. Okay. So you never seen one of these before? All right. So while I'm up here, as the current goes up, as soon as I cross my, now in this case, it's going to be um, 1.2 volts, right? Because I need to get between top and bottom. So as soon as I cross 1.2 volts, I'm going to go this way, flowing that way, through that one, right, down there, 
and back. So I've completed a circuit. Right. When I'm on, in fact, let me do this in the right color. All right. So to match that time here, I start out here. I go through this guy, taking a six, point, six tenths of a volt diode drop. Right. I flow through our load. I come back around and flow back to my, my source. Okay. So direction of current is that way. I get a diode drop on both sides, right? Remember that I have that, when I look at my diode, right, it doesn't start conducting until I get six tenths of a volt across it. And in this case, I got two diode drops, right? Because I've got to go, I've got to get that one to conduct and that one to conduct. So the first 1.2 volts that this goes up, I get nothing. And the last. And the last, right? So under 1.2 volts, I get nothing out of it, all right? But anything above 1.2 volts, I get I get it going this way. Now, if I do it, and let's see if I can change colors here. Eh, cancel. Um, so the other way, I'll do it in black when I'm down here. So when it switches polarity, all right, then I'm negative here, which means that I want to flow from the bottom to the top, and so I'm going to go this way through that one, around again, through this one, and back in. Which means that notice that the current flows the same direction through my load, regardless of the fact that this one is oscillating. So what this does is it turns an oscillating current into something that looks like that. It takes that bottom and it flips it back around on top. And this is called rectification. When it does that, and of course the price I pay is that below 1.2 volts, I get nothing. Right? So if this is a 120 volt, I don't care so much. Yeah. Do you also have a voltage drop at voltage where you're still down? Yeah, effectively our load will be one point. Basically, you, you just clip the bottom one point, the, the bottom one point two volts in here. Uh, basically, get clipped out and it just lands on top of that, and you get that little gap going. And the way you, you deal with it, you put a bunch of caps in there to uh, to filter this out, so that you uh, so that instead you get something you know, the average waveform, which you know is going to do something like that, and then smooth it out. But this is used all the time. Uh, the other place we use uh, the uh, the diodes is the inductive kickback protection. So like we said, we have our inductor. We're flowing current by it. And then we open the switch at the bottom of it. And what that's going to cause it to happen is it's going to cause, remember, it's going to keep pulling. right? Think of the momentum it has. It wants to keep flowing. right? And so it's going to keep raising the potential on this side right? to keep the current flowing until it's going to arc across that switch, which is generally uh, not nice things to do. Uh, it's very easy with even a small inductor to generate, you know, two, three hundred kilovolts uh, doing this, if, especially if that switch opens rather fast, right? It's the LDIDT. Well, if DIDT is very, very small because you've got a MOSFET that opens fully in a nanosecond, right? All of a sudden, it, you know, L doesn't have to be very big for V to go very, very large because DT is so damn small, right? And so, you generally don't want this to happen. This will, this will wreak havoc on your, uh, on your circuits. And so what you do is you say, look, I'm going to put a kickback diode across the inductor. So what happens here is when, the, when you're flowing normally, right, the voltage is high here, the voltage is low. Let's say this is tied to ground. The voltage is low here, which means this one is reverse bias, so it's not going to drive. All right, so all of your current flows through the inductor. However, when you open this switch and this, this potential goes rising way up down here, well, then this one goes into conduction and it allows this current to keep recirculating back around, going through the resistance that's in there and dissipating. Right? And so it allows you to dissipate that. And it means that the voltage at this point will never rise above 0.6 above whatever your supply is. Right? And so it will clamp the voltage and keep it from spiking way up. 
and in exchange, it will take a much longer time to dissipate. Right? And we'll get to, when we do motors, we'll get to do that. Uh, the analogy of this is, and it's a little imprecise, but, you know, okay, so I've got my, my water wheel, right, that's got a whole lot of momentum coming through here. And, right, when I shut off the, uh, when I shut off the pump, it's going to still keep jamming water through and start, right, so I'm going to try to basically shut this off. The pressure is going to go way, 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 way up. And so what I do instead is I have my little check valve here that allows water to flow back around. So as the pressure goes up, it simply forces it past this little check valve back into the wheel, and the wheel has something to keep pumping through as it slows down. So it doesn't just build up pressure. It just keeps flowing down as it slows down. Right? And it's, as I said, at, at some point, and you'll see the, uh, the next ones, uh, which will be the last ones we, uh, we do, it's going to get, um, the analogy is going to get a little stretched. So, but we'll. How long does it take to uh, undamp uh, it? Uh, it depends. You're usually talking a couple of microseconds. Um, so not a long time. Right? And that's a, uh, but um, having a, you know, a couple of hundred volts on your circuit, even for a couple of microseconds, is not a good thing. And so having it smooth that out so that the most you get is, you know, 14. You, know, you can withstand 14 volts. You can't withstand. So what happens, what happens when you have this, this undamped inductive kick right, all the time is that you, you are starting to erode the oxides inside the chip, inside your, your switches, whether you, whether you think you are or not. There's enough current there that it creates lots of, uh, of potential sort of blowing little pieces off. And eventually it will give out. And here is the perverse thing. It won't die immediately. Um, but it will die at some point. And so you don't know when. So essentially you've created a bomb inside your circuit that's going to stop working at some indeterminate point in the future, which is very, very bad because you'll, it's just the, you don't want to introduce those kinds of bugs into your stuff. And Murphy dictates, and Murphy dictates that it will always happen at the, uh, at the wrong time. All right. So here goes the – this, this one's the, the hard-pressed analogy. Okay. So I have my pipe, which I want to flow fluid down. I have this valve with a little pin here, and I've got another pipe flowing in here. If I flow water through here, it's going to push this thing, let's do this one, it's going to push this thing out of the way and allow much current to go by. Right? So I flow water in here, pushes the valve back, and allows the the greater current, the greater pipe to, to flow. So this would be the base. This would be the collector. And this would be the emitter. And this is a NPN bipolar junction transistor. And what it looks like, how we draw it, is this. All right, so again, this is the collector. This is the emitter, and this is the base. So the idea is that I'm going to flow current in the base, so I base, right? And in exchange, I'm going to get a much bigger current flowing by from the collector to the emitter. Right? So this is a current-controlled valve. So a transistor is a current-controlled valve. I put some current on the base. I get much more current. Um, flowing across as well, okay? And again, because it can't accumulate anywhere. And so this is a, um, and the rough, so we use in this class, we use our transistors entirely as switches, all right? We want them fully saturated, fully on. And if I do that, I get roughly, in order to be fully saturated, I get that ICE uh, is equal to approximately 10 times IB. So I have a current ratio of approximately 10. Uh, generally, 10 to 100 is where they talk about. We like to be on the lower end of that because then it doesn't matter what transistor you use. They will all be fully on. And that is called saturation. Now, in order to do this, this looks kind of like a diode. I have to have V base greater than... Uh, v base plus, 
uh, 0.7 has to be greater than the collector. All right. So 0.6, 0.7. I've got to raise that point uh, about six tenths of a volt because this looks like a diode. And if I do, then the difference between the collector and the emitter is going to be approximately 0.2 volts. All right. When it's fully turned on. All right. And that's so I'm going to lose. I'm going to still have a little low voltage drop across it, but only two tenths of a volt if I'm fully turned on. All right. So that is the. So again, remember that I inject a little current. And I get a lot of current flowing by, ten times the amount. What happens if you inject a lot of current? Um, well, then you get more current flowing by, right? That's the the idea. Is you can you 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 want to you want to have a ratio of about ten, right? So ten is fully enhanced. Doing it lower than ten doesn't really buy you anything. You don't get you don't this point two volts doesn't drop any lower, right? It stays sort of right about there. Yeah. Any vanilla NPN transistor or PNP transistor. Yeah, BJTs. Now, FETs work differently. We'll get to how FETs work right now. All right? So to do a FET, this is where the analogy gets really strained. All right, I have my same pipe. I have my same valve, right, that's going to let with my little hinge here. But instead of being a pipe flowing in, I have this is attached to a diaphragm. A little arm attached to a diaphragm. So when I increase the pressure here, the diaphragm bulges, and I open up the valve and let current go by. So this is the gate. This is the drain up here. And this is the source. All right. And so uh, this is a MOSFET. Can Daryl, I ask you to find me a plug for this side. Oh, thanks. Perfect. All right. So in this one, I have a MOSFET. All right. And so the MOSFET looks like, so this is an N-channel MOSFET. So here we have the gate. We have the drain and the source. And so this one, this is an end channel. And so again, if I put pressure on here, if I put voltage on here, the voltage has to be greater than the source. So if V gate to source is greater than some threshold, and that threshold depends very much on the kind of MOSFET you're using. All right? So there are TTL level MOSFETs where that needs to get to 1 volt, 2 volts, 3 volts. Um, there are power MOSFETs where that needs to get to 10 to 12 volts all right, in order to be fully enhanced. So when it's on, we call it fully enhanced. And I don't know where they came up with these, but that's what they, they are. And the way I know it's on is the drain to source, our drain to source, right? So when it's off, when the gate is, at, is less than threshold, our drain to source is approximately 10 mega ohms. Okay? When it's on, when it's fully enhanced and really turned on, um, these look like approximately 0 0.02 ohms. Uh, the ones that are, that's 20 milli ohms. Um, the ones that are power MOSFETs that are meant to sort of throw large currents around, those will often get down into the 2 to 3 milli ohms. So 0 0.001, it's actually less resistance than a wire going across. All right? And the reason that makes them so cool is because the resistance is so small, they don't actually dissipate a lot of heat. Even though they're letting a huge amount of current go by, they don't get hot. All right? The other thing, of course, is that the current can flow in either direction. Right? So often these are referred to as analog switches. Right? Once you get the gate above the source, it goes. Now, the P channels are the opposite. The gate has to go below the drain, same thing as the P. So we'll go through. Um, so we have the NPN and the N channel. All right, so the NPN has this guy. And in order to turn it on, I've got the um, V base. So it says base collector emitter. And I've got the uh, v base uh, plus 0.6 volt, uh, not 06, 
It'd be nice if it was only if it was 06, uh, is greater than V emitter, and that V collector to emitter is approximately 0.2 volts when it is on. Okay. For the end channel, I've got gate, source, uh, drain up top, and source on the bottom. So here I've got uh, V gate has to be greater V gate minus V source has to be greater than the threshold. And in exchange, RDS on uh, equals to uh, approximately 0.1 ohm. All right, So it gets a very small resistance across it. The P channel, P channel and the PNP transistor. So this one looks like All right, and again, this is the collector, the base, the emitter. And here, I've got that in order to turn, oh, and the last thing here is that IB uh, should be approximately ICE over 10. All right, to make sure that it's fully, fully on. Um, so this one, I want that uh, VB uh, plus 0.6 volts should be less than VC, right? So this one I get by raising the base above the emitter. This one I get by dropping the base below the collector, all right? To do that. So this one's sort of the high side. This is the low side, all right, if you think about it. And again, same thing, uh, VCE is going to be approximately... Uh, 0.2 volts, and IB should be approximately ICE over 10. So all those are um, identical. All right. And then the P-channel set, so this has the, uh, the one going out this way. All right. So again, the gate, the, um, uh, here we put the source up on top, and the drain below. All right. And for this one, I want that um, V gate, um, so V source or V gate, yeah, yeah. V source minus V gate is less than, is greater than a threshold. So the idea here is I have to drop the gate below the source to turn it on. And then, again, RDS on. And this one's going to be approximately 0.3 ohms. So the P channels take about six times the silicon area to make than an N channel. And they can't get the resistance quite as low. And they're always more expensive. Right? Now, the, the reason that this becomes a bit of an issue is when you're driving motors, generally you want to tie your supply up to there. And if I had something that was 10 volts above my supply, well, I'd use that as my supply instead. Right? So you have to somehow, if you want to use end channels, lift the gate above the highest voltage that you have access to. Right? And that, so that's why they still use P's. Right? Because if you use the P's, it's easy. Then I just have to short it to ground, and it turns on. Right? Uh, as opposed to I just, you know, short the gate to ground, and this thing is on. Right? And so that's the, uh, the issue. And there are, there are specialized chips that are gate drivers that tend to, uh, to push it up. So that's the, uh, we'll stop at this part. So that's sort of all of the, uh, the basics. And then we'll continue on uh, Monday. I'll send out a, a spam for time for, for anyone else. OK, let's uh, save this one. And let me stop that.